Are there any stereotypes of this specialty? Well, yes, I would say that most people think, actually within the um, health sector, most people think, oh, um, we don't know, we just have the technical know-how, we don't know the science behind what we are doing. But it's called medical mm-hmm. laboratory science for a reason, yeah. not medical laboratory technology. Yeah. So everything, of every machine we work with, every equipment, every instrument we work with as a working principle. Hello, Sherry. Hello, our viewers. Um, today, we are privileged to have another guest on the channel who will be giving us an exposition about one of the health professions within Nigeria, Africa, and of course, anywhere in the globe you're watching from, you would benefit, you will get an insight into what the profession is like. So we call her Sherry, but I'll let her do us the honors of introducing herself, you know, completely. So you're welcome once again. Thank you very much. All right. We'd like to know your full name, your profession, and any other thing you feel you want to. Thank okay, um, my name is Sherry Fat Jimo Oiza. I people know me as Sherry, as you rightly said. Yeah. I am a medical laboratory scientist. I just finished my internship program at the University of Abuja Teaching Hospital, so I am no more provisionally licensed. I'm not permanently Fully licensed. licensed. Congratulations! I, uh, thank you very much. I'm into infectious diseases, um, public health, and communications. And in that light, I handle the communications team. The communications team, yeah, for MedLab Convo. Okay. So you should check us out. Thank you. All right. Glad to have you once again. Thank you. Yeah. Now, you know, just casting our minds back, when you were in high school, secondary school, what course did you think you would study in the university? Oh, easily. I thought I would study medicine and surgery. I wanted to become a neurosurgeon, inspired by Ben Carson, of yeah, course. Yeah, the popular Ben Carson fever. Exactly. <laughs> so that caught <laughs> some of us to seem to have fallen in love with the profession. Because I've worked with you, you know, in the lab. <laughs> You're very enthusiastic, very efficient, and one can sense the passion, if I'll put it that way. Thank you very much. Okay. So how long does it take to train to become a medical laboratory scientist okay so um you do five years in school so the first two years i mean the first year is the normal physics chemistry the second year the basic medical sciences anatomy biochemistry physiology then the remaining three years so from that second year to the third year you make that cross from preclinicals to clinicals so um part three to part five you are, your training is a blend of laboratory postings and rigorous lectures. Interesting. So after that, the one year internship. So like you get inducted after the fifth year, then you um, undergo your one year internship. So okay. that's like six years in total. Yeah, six years in total. Now, um, post training, what's the job market like? Is it competitive? Uh, prospective medical laboratory scientists assured of, you know, getting jobs within uh, regional terrain and also perhaps globally, if you have an idea. Okay, I would say um, globally, yes, because there's a demand yeah. for, I think outside of Nigeria, we are called biomedical scientists. Yes. yes. So there's a demand for biomedical scientists outside of Nigeria. That's why there's also like a brain drain currently. Our Medical Laboratory Science Council of Nigeria are also complaining that people are leaving of course people are leaving training yeah, in nigeria i would say that if you know how to the market is there but it's only open to people who are open to opportunities and people who network so if you don't want just any offer right from school you should like network with people even during your internship here because getting the internship is not easy so this is why networking so the, the job market is competitive quite all right but I believe in excellence if you are excellent on your own and you've carved a niche out for yourself i mean the sky is not even yeah. in your limit it's a starting point yeah very true now um what are the options post graduation post internship beyond working like in the labs i'm very sure that you know prospective scientists can 
maybe think that they might want to do something outside you know of the laboratory setting what are the options in line with the passions that people may have that they can work in okay so i would answer that with a funny story okay so growing up i didn't want to so when i got to high school that i wanted to become a medical laboratory scientist or rather sorry a doctor neurosurgeon yeah. growing up when i was in like primary school i wanted to become a newscaster like a journalist of some sort yeah. because i was very inquisitive i used to ask questions a lot so when i got into uni i found out that i still had that passion so you could say that i have a creative side and i have like this serious side like i'm working in the health sector yeah so to blend it so when i was in 300 level i was thinking that i can't work on the bench the rest of my life that was when i stumbled upon medical combo i started working with them so i would say that there are opportunities beyond the bench and that's what most prospective scientists tend to um, find that hard to believe you could work you could work in public health yeah i'd worked in a public health organization before i came to do my internship so you could work in um, public health you could work in the communication space because there's a lot of mis misinformation out there we saw that during um the covid era and during ebola yeah. like people saying they are using salt yeah, true. exactly so you could work in um, occupational health you could work as a um you could work in research research and development i mean the people that came up with the vaccines uh it's they're, they're like a body it's not just a doctor yeah, or sure. a, exactly a full, team. a full team and definitely most of the research takes place like in the laboratory lab. setting so exactly so you could work in research you could also work as a lecturer i mean who would train prospective scientists yeah so um these are other fields and I feel like you, if you have a passion, you can blend it together with MedLab. You just have to find like a way to strike a balance. True. If you paint, you can use the painting. There's art in medicine. You can use the painting to tell stories. True. If you sing, you can use the, your song to tell stories. So like all those things. So you don't you don't have to be boxed up and True. just say you're working in the lab. Yeah. All right. So for our viewers, you've heard, you know, a host of options that are available to you. And also, perhaps I should now ask, what's the role of technology, AI? you know in lab science in medical laboratory science you know today what are the prospects okay so um most of the equipment that we work with they start from like this um first generation okay take for example um let me use the um, auto analyzer in hematology yeah. so we use that to do um full block count so full block count is to know like the different parameters like okay how is your red cell how are the shapes, how are the size, and this will give an insight on as to what is actually wrong with the person. So st we started with using just the microscope to read the film. So they say you're reading the film. So you actually see the morphology of the cell and all that. Then we got to using a semi-automatic analyzer. Everything is still working on the first principle. But after that, it's, it wasn't still key enough i would use that then we now have like an automatic analyzer that analyzes all forms of um cells in the blood including then this would also detect will also flag any like deficiency like maybe there's iron deficiency anemia to flag it mm. i mean we had it in um university of Andrew city hospital yeah. so now we are seeing imagine technology like the use of um machine learning and neural network so this uses images so aside from just flagging it this without the flagging it will like okay maybe this person has this deficiency but this technology would like there's an image of what a red cell would look like if it is iron deficient if it is hypochromic if it is this yeah, sure. so if this um person's um this said patient is having this and this like maybe let's take for example iron deficiency yeah. in the in the system this um neural network and machine learning would enable will turn around time yeah, it increases turn around time true, true. so rather than wait for you to read film and okay i'll just give you like the way we do i don't give you preliminary prelim first yeah so instead of that you already have an idea you already know that okay this is what's wrong with the person and you increase turn yeah. around time yeah okay all right um what makes the practice so unique 
of all the you know other healthcare specialties, what makes your profession stand out? Okay, so we have this saying that we are the oracles mm-hmm. of modern medicine. So people, some people like to call us. That Divya sounds nice <laughs> because we don't get to see the patient. Yeah, but with a sample, I can know what is wrong with the patient. Even if you just come for like routine checkup. Yeah. Once I see that, okay, you're having a fasting blood sugar of let's say 12. That is a problem. Yeah. But you're having a fasting blood sugar of even if it's borderline, okay. We need to detect this thing. Something is going on here. Yeah. So that's that's what fascinates me the most. And I'm still in awe because we just one sample. There's a lot that, that can, can be, be found. Yes. Very true. Um, so if for the aspiring scientist out there, why should he or she be encouraged to choose this profession? Okay. So um why should they be encouraged to choose the profession? Yeah. I'll be very honest. Uh there's a lot you can do to help. You don't have to i mean you can have the passion to become a doctor like i did but if you are finding it difficult to like if you are struggling to find a path you can actually give medical lab a medical lab science a trial because i don't know how to put it but it's just it, there's this thrill that i get that i feel like most people should also so Ada. Hi. Sorry. Yeah, it's okay. So why should an aspiring medical laboratory scientist choose your profession? What is it that should encourage or affirm that decision? I mean, I called us oracles the other time. So if you do want to be like a DBR, a modern day DBR, if far from a Yoruba people, yeah. you should you should you should consider coming to study medical laboratory science. Now, like on a more serious note. If you're like me and you are you have this social anxiety and you don't really like relating with patients i mean you still relate with patients but not as much as the clinicians do yeah. because we work behind the scenes and if you are really interested in research you should try medical laboratory science is there any reason why someone should not consider this profession the workload the workload is a lot because i think um with the way times are going now you see more people getting sicker yeah the hospitals are getting filled up i mean as an intern i barely had breaks imagine having a week leave in three months and having no life outside outside like a you can't try other things without neglecting um your profession so i would say that's the downside to it the workload is a lot Okay. Are there any stereotypes of this specialty? Well, yes. I would say that most people think, actually within the um, health sector, most people think, oh, um, we don't know. We just have the technical know-how. We don't know the science behind what we are doing. But it's called mm-hmm. medical laboratory science for a reason, yeah. not medical laboratory technology. Yeah. So everything, of every machine we work with, every equipment, every instrument we work with as a working principle, and this working principle is based on how there are different like biochemical reactions going on in the body. Take for example, um, let's say uh, liver function test. So there are different um, enzymes that have been analyzed in this liver function test. So this machine that is analyzing these enzymes, it is based on like it's an in vitro um, process of what is going on in the body. So if you don't understand the process of what is going on in the body, how would you understand the values? That's being produced by the machine. How would you be able to interpret it? So most people just believe we can't interpret the results. We just give our results. Okay. But meanwhile, the results, we see the results relating with the personal diagnosis. We can tell a lot already. Yeah. So I think that's that's one thing. And I think perhaps in you know, I don't want to say say not climbs now, but in some other parts of the world, there would be some sort of collaboration between the clinicians and the you know, laboratory scientists, not just at the point of send the patient's results exactly. and all that, but like you can actually maybe put your brains together to... I mean, I have someone working in um, Ireland. Yeah. And they do wardrobes together. Wow. 
and it would it would it would be very amazing yeah because you are seeing the patient but imagine we're getting a sample here seeing the serum already you can see that okay this person has a high um, bilirubin level yeah i'm actually seeing the patient seeing that the patient is jaundiced that would like give more life to your work and you would also be invigorated yeah. to do more things and of course more brains for the team would mean faster turnaround time exactly and, you know, like patients the... will not be there will not be a backlog of patients in the hospital true true so yeah this is an encouragement to i think maybe our generation and um, we should look forward to more collaboration there is no one there's no island uh -huh, in the sometimes our ego you know we tend to get the better part of us exactly. whether doctors <laughs> nurses everybody yeah. wants to just take their territory like don't cross you know and all of that but yeah we should look towards collaborating more as a team now what how many hours on average do you work in a week <sighs> best case scenario worst case scenario okay best case scenario let me see um okay let me do it like this when you're not on call it's to eight to five because it's not eight to four you can't close okay. by four so let's say an average um about 50 hours a week when you're not on call yeah so when you're on call you're factoring in 24 hours in sorry you have two hours break so let's say 22 hours times three that was like 66 hours yeah plus the 50 plus okay so like it's a lot. 106 like hours. if you're on yeah, weekend it's, call like it's 72 hours it's a lot it's a lot, it's a lot. that's that's a lot that is a lot i have to say again that's a lot it is a lot yeah it's you know as i was i posted somewhere recently how one of the weeks during my own internship as a you know doctor i worked for like 120 hours and i knew how i felt that week it felt like i was just you know in limbo I was, yes in limbo i was no longer in touch with reality it was just okay i'm looking forward to the end of this and, all. and we hope you know like changes will come at some point either the leaders there now or by god's grace definitely when we get to those places where we can make decisions and make better policies yeah better policies what's the most rewarding part of your field i feel like you've made reference to this already but yeah let's hear from you again. What... okay okay i'll just paint a scenario let's say um you get a sample the first time i'll see you use full block m um, sorry fasting blood sugar mm -hmm. because diabetes is on a high now so let's say you get a um, fasting blood sugar result of like 22 millimole per liter. I've seen worse. Then let's say glycated hemoglobin, because it's also used to then get a glycated hemoglobin of like 7.2, which is also high. Then you see that okay, this person has started like treatment, uh, sorry, management rather, then managing the um, diabetes, irrespective of whatever type it is. Then you see this person coming to do tests, coming to do tests. And you see these values going down slowly. And I'm like, hmm, this person, like I'm doing my part to like help yeah. this person. Yeah. I'm doing my part to help this person know that all the effort I'm putting in is not, not in vain. Not in vain. Then one other thing is getting to help patients. Like when patients come into the lab and they look lost, you're able to help them, like help them get whatever they need. So just so that they, they won't feel frustrated. That's another thing, at least on my own part, maybe because I like to help people. Yeah. So yes, I think that's the then the fact that you don't have to see the patient before telling what is what telling what is wrong about. And them. eventually, um, though sometimes we can hazard a guess as to what's wrong with the patient before you know results come, but eventually we need the laboratory scientist yeah. perspective. Exactly. Yeah, that's the deal breaker most times. No matter what we see, you know, from the bedside and all that, sometimes we're just in limbo until something comes. Something from comes lab. from the lab. So, like, yes. you guys occupy a an indispensable space because so you say. see, you you see, like we'll be in the lab, you'll be like, oh my god, oh my god, like you're staring into the microscope, you're like, oh my god, this is actually what is wrong with this this patient, or maybe it's like a bacteria that is not common. Yeah. So you have to start talking about okay the history of the patient where the patient has traveled to you know all these things trying to search for answers sorry i'm just really excited yeah, about yeah, it yeah i can see we can see the excitement <laughs> on your face that's great um is it financially rewarding 
compared to the stress that the job comes with? No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say it is. It's a very I think sincere answer. Most um, profession within the health sector fall in that in that capacity. Yeah. Compared to the stress that comes with it, it's not financially rewarded, especially in this climate. Yeah. Is there any way you plan to navigate that in future? That maybe the viewers can benefit from. How to navigate how? Optimizing your work schedule and also finding yourself in maybe places where the pay is something sustainable. Right, right. So I think uh well I would like to gain experience mm -hmm. from a more saner climate then take that experience i mean people are jack mine now and be like i don't want to come back anymore yeah. but reverse is the case for me i would really like to come back because i mean they don't just like home they say yeah. so in this place you have been in that light and get um acquainted with policy making so that these people working in the health sector would not even feel the need to travel to gain i mean you can travel to like yeah you can go on programs go on government programs, sponsored study, and all that. but not just to leave i mean we are suffering though know? we are really suffering yeah, in this country exactly so instead of taking that knowledge and just keep pushing like pushing their own agenda why don't we push our own agenda here so that's why i feel that we need more people within um the health sector going into administrative um, places like policy making i mean national assembly and all that so they can affect these changes for yeah. us all right so what's the work-life balance like well uh i don't know how to say this but i feel like you should just you will be the one to like take active efforts because i don't think there's work-life balance i would say it's work-life integration because you try to like fit your work into how your life how you want your life to be designed yeah. so i mean you can't live life off your work it's not work 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 all the time i mean they say all oh, work and not play mix jackie door boy or if you have other things you have to do so i think um time management is essential for work-life integration rather than trying to balance it okay if work is slow or maybe if we don't have like a lot of patients what can i use that time to do at least that's how i try to think about it because yeah. during internship we don't just work on the bench we also do um seminar presentations so you take topics and talk about maybe any imagine um trend within that field yeah. or that um rotation that you're currently doing so if like we are not slumped in the lab what i do is i just use that time to do other things or other things other work i'm doing aside from the internship then i don't use my weekends i don't joke with my weekends most times I'm, I'm not even within the hospital facility on weekends so you can you won't even see me you can you can't look for me so you get to do other things i get to do other things during the weekend then if i want to go out okay, weekend then during the leave also that we get so if you get leaves i mean please take optimal use of it and yeah don't, don't give it, it to them you vend it do you have any regrets yeah, one. I regret not knowing about the course sooner. Yeah, so maybe yes. that would have bought you time. That would have bought trying exactly. To... That would have bought me time, and that's why I'm actively trying to like push the gospel. Yeah, the like awareness. The science, yes. Okay. Finally, or the last but not the least, what are the top three factors anyone should consider in choosing a course to study? Okay. First things first, um, the prospects. I'm talking. I'm talking based on. I'm using the Nigerian factor to talk now. The prospects outside, like in the labor market, how how fast would you be able to get a job? Then, secondly, passion. If um, the prospects are high and you're not passionate about what you do, you'll be like a decimal, and you would not progress. Then I think last the last one for me, I mentioned prospects, I mentioned passion. Then um, how well you would thrive as a person, like beyond 
yeah. schooling yeah. when you eventually get out of uni how will you would you thrive so all these things will also become the motivation for you when you're in school to like push harder and get like good grades rather than just reads to pass all right finally 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 is there any challenge you've had perhaps one maybe during your undergraduate training or during your practice year over the last one year that you would like to share and how you overcame it perhaps it will benefit someone out there okay i would say um okay i would say uh i think related with patients especially um in hematology um yeah. blood transfusion department because that's like the let's say the heart vibe. yeah uh, that, i would say that the, the heart engine, uh, the exactly heart. of of the lab most everybody wants blood then there are certain protocols that are placed so that everybody <laughs> I'm just the will come and harass you guys <laughs> so, so everybody <sighs> will get blood but if these protocols are not being followed you will not get your blood yeah. and it will look as if we are bad at our job so um navigating that i would say it, it, it took or rather it takes emotional intelligence yeah I if not agree. you would fight with everybody fight with the doctor fight with, you the, potter, fight with the doctors fight, fight with, with patient patient these patients are already frustrated yeah. by the system so the best you can do do your job but in doing that be empathetic also because you might also be a patient one day yeah so emotional intelligence is very very key and it's one thing that i applied while i was there i can't fight mm. you have to be logical in thinking logic thinking and logical thinking rather and emotional intelligence i feel like once i hacked that thing back in uni it helped me because i had a problematic project supervisor because we do like a research project at the end of we don't do just literature review you would carry out the research your findings everything and my supervisor was not lenient at all so that logical thinking and emotional intelligence also helped me with my supervisor and then applying it also during my internship here. So I think those those two, yeah, those two experiences. All right. Um, thank you for sharing your thoughts, you know, wisdom, insights, and everything you've put out here today. I'm very grateful on behalf of the viewers now, the viewers in future, the viewers in five years' time that will be watching this <laughs> video. Um, perhaps we can make something you know out of this and would also hope that we can do another video sometime in future when you know we've made progress in our different career paths and just do like a flashback on how much god has helped us it's been my pleasure having you on the channel yeah thank you very much for having me and i would very much love to talk about any progress that we've made or yeah. progress that we would make yeah in the future all right thank you yeah